Aloha, welcome back. Today we are going to learn about the skill of measuring food and fluid intake. Now if we're going to be measuring how much the patient is taking in, we also have to be measuring how much the patient is putting out. Okay? So there's uh, lots of different reasons uh, for measuring uh, fluid and food intake. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the amount of fluid that goes into the body should really equal the amount of fluid that comes out of the body in a 24-hour day. And so uh, as nurses, there are different reasons uh, for measuring intake and output. Uh, we're going to talk about those during the, the course of this lecture. Uh, the body needs nutrition as fuel to meet the energy demand. So we know that uh, our patients need fluid and they need nutrition. And so we need to make sure that they're getting enough of each of those. Every adult needs about 2,000 mLs of fluid uh, or milliliters uh, to remain adequately hydrated each 24-hour period. And uh, they also need about 2,000 calories from food to meet their energy demands. And this is um, all in about the course of a day. Um, and we know that poor food and fluid intake can put our patients at risk for an imbalance that can lead to many health problems. And so chronic disease and other health conditions can lead to imbalances of food and fluid intake. So let's talk a little bit about a fluid deficit. So what would cause an imbalance of fluid intake? Well, it's very possible that we could have someone who has difficulty swallowing. And we call that dysphagia, impaired swallowing. Uh, if a patient has uh, dysphagia, uh, there are several concerns, one of which is that they are going to um, choke and aspirate uh, some of the fluids that they're trying to drink. Um, but generally speaking, uh, one of our first concerns uh, when we identify dysphagia uh, after identifying um, how big of a, a risk their swallowing problem is, we want to know that it also puts them at a risk for not getting enough fluids. Um, and so we want to uh, keep that in mind when our patients become dysphagic. Um, if someone has burns, uh, they will lose a lot of fluid. If we have someone who's taking diuretics like Lasix, which is a medication that helps us get excess fluid off the body, we also have to remember that that's fluid loss. And so we have to make sure that the fluid that's going out um, is you know, being adequately replaced by their oral intake. Um, diarrhea is another condition uh, that causes a lot of fluid loss from the body. And of course, um, we've all learned that when uh, the physician orders the patient to be NPO, or to have nothing by mouth, then certainly uh, they're not going to be taking in any fluids, uh, at least by mouth. And so those are some of the considerations that nurse as nurses that we need to think about uh, that may cause fluid deficits um, in our patients. Um, other things that can cause imbalances um, of fluid um, intake and output um, would, would need to be considered fluid retention, right? Um, so in this case, we're not concerned uh, so much about th them being able to intake the fluid, right? What we're really concerned about is for them holding on to too much fluid. And so um, in congestive heart failure, we can have patients that um, lead, uh, patients that end up uh, with too much fluid on board. Okay. And the reason for this can be due to problems with their kidneys functioning and also just the problems that they're having with their cardiac um, function, the function of their heart pump. And we're going to talk more about what that is later. Um, but the other condition that can cause fluid retention is when we have a patient with chronic kidney disease. Um, so chronic kidney disease can lead to too much fluid on board. Um, so those are also important to consider. Um, in terms of nutrition, we want to think about what the risk factors are um, for, for poor nutrition. And in older adults, um, there can be several factors. 
Um, poor dentition is one of them. For example, if the, the patient has difficulty uh, with their chewing um, because they can't find their dentures or they've got a sore in their mouth or a, a, an abscess on one of their teeth and we're not aware of it and there's pain in their mouth, then they're going to be less likely um, to comfortably be able to chew um, and, and eat their food. Um, uh, also, we mentioned dysphagia, which is impaired swallowing or difficulty swallowing. If we have a patient that has dysphagia, um, they will definitely uh, be eating probably s more slowly. Um, we will have to make changes in their diet um, to, for their food consistency to be better um, suited for them to swallow. And, um, you know, this can impair their ability to enjoy the meal, right? So think about it. You go from eating foods that are solid, regular portions of chicken that you're cutting up and enjoying, and now all of a sudden you have dysphagia, and so we're going to give you a, a mince diet or a, even a pureed diet where your chicken is now minced up into little tiny pieces or even pureed into a consistency of, of a really um, uh, maybe not, not very enjoyable, right, consistency for some people. And so we have to be aware of this, and we have to be able to identify it and then do things to advocate for our patients to find them things that they enjoy um, eating. Um, older adults might have a decreased sense of taste and smell. Um, they may also have kind of a, a decreased uh, sensation of, of feeling hungry. Um, uh, and, and the opposite can happen too. They can have a, a decreased feeling for when they're feeling satiated or full. And so the, uh, it can be a sensory problem. Uh, we also have older adults that may have a cognition problem where um, they are, are um, having dementia and maybe they are no longer capable of really thinking about eating. Maybe they need a lot of encouragement when it comes to sitting down and eating their meal. They need reminders and cues for picking up their fork or their spoon and taking a spoonful um, and putting it into their mouth and chewing and swallowing. And we're gonna learn more about that um, moving forward as well. So in terms of measuring food intake, um, we want to try to estimate the percentage of the food that was eaten from the meal tray. So it's not an exact measurement. Um, it's really kind of more like taking a look at what came on the tray and then identifying when the patient is finished with the meal, how much of that meal they took in. And, you know, most of the residents in long-term care um, are just that, they're residents. And so they can decide how much um, or, or how little they want to eat. Um, uh, but as nurses, um, it's our responsibility to make sure that they are getting a good amount of nutrition um, to keep them thriving, okay? And so we might say the patient ate zero to 25% of the meal. We might document that they had 25 to 50% of the meal that they ate seven, uh, 50 to 75% of the meal, or somewhere in the range more of about 75 to 100% of the meal. And sometimes um, residents will eat a big breakfast and they won't eat a whole lot at lunch, or they, they're not big breakfast eaters, but they will eat a lot more at lunch, um, and maybe dinner will be the, the biggest meal of the day. It really just depends on the individual. And so here we can see an example of a tray. Um, we've got some jello here, we've got some milk, looks like there's some juice and some pudding. Um, we can see a, a slice of bread, some cheese, and an egg. And then if we go to the next slide, um, we can see that a certain amount of the tray was eaten. The jello is gone, the egg is gone, a little bit of the pudding is gone. Um, and in this case, it looks like the patient had probably, oh, some, somewhere between uh, maybe 25 um, to 50 percent. Um, not really quite 50 percent, but they did eat the whole egg and they ate all of the jello and some of the pudding. So 
just an, an eyeballing of the food and um, kind of write down what, what we think the percentage was. And, and you'll have your instructor in clinical kind of help you look at the tray to kind of identify um, over time, you'll get a better sense of what we consider to be, you know, almost half of the tray as opposed to only 25% of the tray. Um, and what 75% is, and, and of course 100%, is that they ate everything. They ate everything off the tray. All the fluids were gone, all the, the bread and the cheese and the egg and pudding and jello were all consumed. Um, in the case where we have someone who is not um, eating, uh, for whatever reason, uh, whether it's difficulty with swallowing, whether it's a problem with dentition, uh, whether it's that they're, they're not really feeling hungry, um, one of the things that the uh, dietitian uh, might order and in, in uh, conference with the physician and the interdisciplinary team might come together and say, well, this patient needs supplementation. And uh, those are high calorie supplements that provide extra calories and nutrients um, when their intake uh, might be inadequate. Um, and so Boost, uh, Boost Plus and Ensure are examples of dietary supplements. We wanna try to encourage um, our residents to drink these. Um, and it's important if, if they like it cold, um, do what we can do to have it nice and cold. If they don't like it cold, maybe they want it to be room temperature. Um, serve it to them however it's, it's most enjoyable for them to consume. Um, that's a really big part of having people feel like they have choices, uh, giving them choices, um, giving them choices in the flavor maybe of the boost. Maybe there's um, some syrup that you can put in it. If you can turn vanilla into chocolate, there may be a chocolate variety, vanilla, there may be strawberry, um, and there may be different types of syrups that we can put in it to change the flavor. So it's always good to ask residents what their favorite flavors are and what they might wanna try um, to make it more palatable. Um, so the balance between uh, fluid intake and output um, is important for nurses to be able to assess. And so we know that when our body fluid becomes more concentrated, uh, what happens is our thirst center uh, in our brain becomes triggered and we feel thirsty, okay? Once our fluid volume is increased, once we go and we, we take a nice huge flask of water and we drink that down, uh, the kidneys will then uh, excrete the excess fluid and waste. Uh, and so this is the normal way that we, we take fluid in and we, we um, expel fluid out. And normally, we said before, uh, we take about 2,000 mLs of fluid in a 24-hour period. Um, and sources of fluid intake can include just oral, right, by mouth, just drinking a cup of water uh, or drinking other things, juices, Gatorade, uh, orange juice, apple juice. Um, we can also have IV fluids, right? So patients can get um, fluids through their IV. Uh, we do get fluid through the food that we eat. Um, I guess uh, fruit would be a really good example of a high water content food, where if we eat uh, some fruit, there's gonna be um, fluid in that. And then tube feedings, right? So not all fluid intake is through the oral route uh, or even through the IV route. We also have patients who have uh, tubes that are either um, coming out of their stomach. Uh, uh, we call these peg tubes. Um, or we could also have a patient who has um, an, a nasogastric tube, which is a tube that goes through the nose, down the back of the throat, and into the stomach. And so these are all sources of, of potential fluid intake for a patient. Um, and how fluid leaves the body uh, can be through uh, just normal urination. Uh, it can be through uh, having diarrhea uh, will, will promote fluid loss. Um, fevers, um, sweating causes fluid loss. Breathing uh, is, is part of what we call our insensible water loss. We lose water just from breathing.
um, and Foley catheter. We could have a Foley catheter that goes up through uh, the urethra into the patient's bladder um, to drain urine into a bag. Um, we can have a urostomy, which is a different type of, of tube that drains urine. Um, this would come, come off of um, the patient's um, kind of uh, suprapubic area. Uh, you could see a, a urostomy tube coming out of the suprapubic area um, that's draining urine. Um, a, a nasogastric tube, which I mentioned before. Um, we have to count drainage that comes out of our patient's wounds as fluid loss because believe it or not, um, a big enough wound that's draining, draining enough fluid can really make a difference in, in our patient's fluid status. Um, and of course, blood loss is also um, considered um, a type of, of fluid loss, right, from the body. And so here we have some examples of some uh, drainage from tubes. We can see here uh, a JP tube, which is draining from a wound. Um, and uh, it's called a, a Jackson Pratt tube. Sometimes patients will come back from surgery with a JP tube that is draining the wound bed um, and fluid will, will be collected in this small collection chamber. Um, you see a woman on the top here with a nasogastric tube inserted, and this is the tube I mentioned that goes up through the nose, down the back of the throat, and into the stomach. And um, sometimes that is connected to suction, where we are uh, pulling uh, contents from the stomach out uh, into, a, into a collection canister. And we're going to talk more about what NG tubes are. Um, an indwelling uh, catheter, an indwelling Foley catheter with a leg bag is another way that um, urine is drained from the body. And then on the bottom here, we see examples of a nephrostomy um, and, and other types of uh, tubes that drain uh, directly from uh, the kidney itself. And so here's uh, just some examples. Here's another look at the nasogastric tube draining stomach contents. We can see here that the tube um, goes down into the stomach and we can see uh, the suction canister um, in this image here that is actually connected to the wall that very gently pulls the stomach contents out. Um, usually when we have to rest the bowel or when uh, the patient has had some surgery um, where we want to rest the bowel or they have a blockage in the bowel and nothing's moving through, we have to, to use an NG tube to drain their stomach contents. Um, so signs of fluid of volume deficits in children and older adults um, can actually be a little similar. Uh, we can see here on the baby, uh, we have a baby uh, with a fluid volume deficit. Uh, we might see tachypnea, which is the fast breathing. Uh, they, they may be tachycardic. Uh, they may have weak peripheral pulses. They might be hypotensive or have a low blood pressure. Um, there are other signs and symptoms um, listed here. Um, sunken eyes, um, no tears, uh, dry mucous membranes, um, reduced urine output, um, and sudden weight loss can be other uh, signs that there's a fluid volume deficit in a child. In the older adult, we can see some similar signs, uh, hypotension again, or low blood pressure. Their heart rate may increase. They may, may become tachycardic. Uh, they may also have dry mucous membranes. Um, we might see concentrated urine, um, in, in which case that would be urine that is a really dark yellow. Um, they may have problems with constipation if they have a fluid volume deficit. Um, and again, uh, we might watch for not only concentrated urine, but a decrease in the urinary output as well. Um, an older adult may present uh, with some dizziness. They may get dizzy um, if they're dehydrated. Um, they might feel weak, um, and they may even present uh, with some confusion. And so these are all um, signs and symptoms to be aware of uh, so that we can uh, um, you know, monitor um, our patients for a fluid volume deficit. Um, 
in the older adults, um, they may not actually uh, feel thirsty. Um, and we know that once we have a dry mouth, um, we are really past the point of kind of just being what we would consider to be a little bit fluid deficient. Once we feel thirst and our mouth is dry, we are really in, in need for a replacement of, of fluids. And so um, we want to keep uh, a watch for that, but we really don't want it to get to that point, right? We want to be offering um, frequent fluids to patients. Uh, we want to offer desirable fluids. Um, for example, maybe they like Crystal Light. Maybe they like um, a product called Boost Breeze, which is a, another type of um, fluid that we can offer. Um, offering fluids between meals is, is absolutely important um, for individuals who might not feel thirsty or might not remember to drink or think about drinking. Um, it's also important to offer non-caffeinated drinks because we know that caffeine um, really kind of does the opposite um, to hydrate us, that caffeine is more of uh, a diuretic effect on our bodies, which kind of causes us to, to urinate. And so if we've got someone that we're trying to improve their fluid uh, status, uh, we kind of want to try to avoid drinks that have caffeine in them. It isn't that they, they aren't um, allowed to have a nice cup of coffee in the morning or a cup of tea as long as that's approved. Um, it's just that we don't want them to be drinking tea or coffee all throughout the day. Um, you'll sometimes see in the uh, uh, plan of care that we are trying to encourage fluids. So we have to make sure that we read the care plan carefully and the orders carefully to distinguish between encouragement of fluids and restriction of fluids. So if we are encouraging fluids, normally it will say that the minimum um, MLs that we want to give that patient is about 1,250 MLs a day. That's the minimum. That means that we want at least 1,250 MLs to be consumed. Um, if, if not, uh, you know, really more than that is what our goal is. So for, for fluid encouragement, we want to encourage fluids. For fluid restriction, I had mentioned before, sometimes our patients with kidney failure or congestive heart failure will tend to retain fluids and hold on to fluids, and they might have a limit in the amount of fluids that they're supposed to be taking in in a 24-hour period. So for example, the maximum fluids that they may be allowed to take in might only be around 800 um, maybe as much as 1,000 mLs. And if you think about it, and we're going to look at the different um, ways of measuring fluid in a little bit, so you'll actually see that really 1,000 mLs of fluid is not a whole lot. Um, however, um, sometimes that's necessary so that people don't end up with fluid overload, um, which means that they've got too much fluid on board. Um, so again, it's important to identify whether the patient is on a fluid encouragement or a fluid restriction, and it may be neither, right? They may not, they may not have either thing in their care plan, which just means that they just kind of have, have fluids kind of ad, ad lib, right? As much as they want or as, as little as they want, as long as they're maintaining a pretty decent amount that they're intaking and putting out. So how do we measure fluid intake? Um, so we need to get a sense of how many milliliters are in everyday cups and bowls that come on the patient's meal tray. Uh, and so, uh, for example, uh, this is a type of measuring cup that you might see in the clinical setting. And you can see on one side of the cup, uh, it's measured in cc's and ml's. Cc's and ml's are the same thing. And on the other side of the cup, we can see that it's measured in uh, fluid ounces. Um, and so it's important for us to be able to convert fluid ounces to milliliters and back and forth pretty um, consistently. It's a very easy calculation for us. You'll get very comfortable with um, understanding fluids and MLs um, the more experience you have um, in, in clinical. And so um, here we can see an example 
of uh, four ounces, uh, which is also equal to half a cup in household measures, which is also equal to 120 mLs. So these are the cool little cups that you get when you go um, on an airplane. Um, and so one of the, uh, these will also come on the patient's meal trays. And if you, if you see these, when I look at this, I automatically know, oh yeah, that's about 120 mLs. Um, but if you look at the, the container very carefully, you will actually even see on there where it says four ounces, and then sometimes it'll say approximately 118 mLs. Well, that's very close to 120, and so we kind of like to round because it's just easier to kind of do the math in our head when we say, yes, okay, four ounces, maybe there's a, a, you know exactly 118 in the cup, but yeah, we're saying it's about 120 mLs. Um, here's another example. This is um, pretty consistent with a soup <clears throat> cup that comes on a, a patient's meal tray. This has got about six ounces of soup in it. Um, in the household measurements, it's three quarters of a cup, and that equals 180 mLs of fluid. Um, so um, as you can see uh, here, one ounce is equal to 30 mLs. This is um, something that you just have to memorize, okay? Every nurse needs to know that there is one ounce um, and, and that is equal to 30 mLs. And this is exactly the amount of fluid that's in our medicine cups. So you can see this picture of a small 30 mL medicine cup um, in, the, in the picture here. And this starts from five mLs. It measures 10, 15, 20, 25, and up to 30 mLs. So this gives you an idea of what 30 mLs looks like, which is again um, equal to one ounce of fluid. Um, so all of our uh, fluids consumed are counted in milliliters. Um, and so uh, these are important basic uh, ones to know. One ounce is 30 mLs, four ounces is 120 mLs, six ounces is 180 mLs, and eight ounces equals 240 mLs. So if we look at a meal tray, uh, we can see here uh, that usually our um, eight ounce uh, coffee mug that's on the tray is about 240 mLs. Um, our soup uh, cup is about 180, and uh, usually our Jello cup uh, contains about 120 mLs. Uh, and you'll get more comfortable with these. And what we'll do is we'll look and see how much the patient has had. So for example, if I look uh, in the, the coffee cup, the mug, and I see that they've had about half of the fluid that was in there, then I'll, I'll know that they had about 120 mLs, right? So it's because that's half of 240. And then I'll just make a mental note that they had half of their coffee, so that's about 120 mLs. They had all of their soup, that's 180. They, they had all of their Jello, and that's another 120. So I would add those together, and I would come up with the amount of fluid that they took in during that meal, okay? And where we document this is on our intake and output record. Um, we keep these um, on patients that are, are specifically on intake and output, and not every patient is on intake and output. Um, some patients, we only are um, really concerned with how much they're taking in specifically. Other patients, we're, we're measuring what they're putting out, and then sometimes it's both. We're measuring intake and we're measuring output. It really depends on the patient's condition, the reason that we're measuring the intake and output, um, and what the physician has ordered. Um, so if we take a close up of what this form looks like, we can see here that on the night shift, it starts at 11 uh, p.m. and goes till 7 a.m. And we can see that we're measuring all the intake from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, PO is by mouth. Um, if they have an IV, we're gonna be measuring how much intake is coming in from the IV fluids. Um, from, from tube feedings, if they're getting a tube feeding. And then we have a section for other. So if there's, if there's some other way that they're getting fluids in. And what we do is over that time frame for that night shift, we every hour will document how much the patient has taken in, and then we will total that up at the end of the shift. Um, here we can see day shift. 
um, is on the same form. So usually each intake and output form will measure the patient's um, intake um, and output over a 24 hour period. And so here we can see day shift starting at 7 a.m. and we're gonna be measuring, measuring um, all the intake off the patient's tray and in between meals um, from the seven o'clock time until the three o'clock time and then we're gonna total that up at the end of the shift. Um, so how much fluid um, does the patient generally put out in 24 hours, right? That's something that we want to um, be able to measure as well. And so here you can see on the intake and output form, we have the output side of the form. And we've got urine listed here, we've got emesis listed, we've got an NG tube listed, we've got stool listed and other. Um, and so again, uh, however your patient is putting out fluid and, and maybe the other could be a, a wound, a wound back, um, we would be measuring the amount of fluid that has come out of the patient uh, over the shift and then we would total that up. So this is called a hat. And if you're not familiar with this, this is what we use um, for both urine and stool collection in the clinical setting. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is the, a hat that's placed in a bedside uh, commode. And you can see that there's actual measuring on the side of it so that after the patient urinates, we can identify how much urine is in there before we um, discard that urine. Um, and flush it down the toilet. We might wanna measure how many mLs of urine was in there before we uh, flush that. And so we can also turn the hat around if we need a stool sample and we can have the patient use the bedside commode um, or, the, or the regular uh, commode in the bathroom uh, to get a stool sample as well. And so this is how we collect um, urine and stool samples. Um, for men, uh, we, we use this uh, collection device called a urinal, and we can see that sometimes uh, this will be hanging on the side of the bed, and we can offer this to the male um, in order to, to urinate, and then again, it's got measurements on the side of it. We can measure um, how much urine was put out and document that value before we um, discard the urine sample. Um, here we can see uh, bedpans, two different types of bedpans that we might use. Um, uh, one is called a fracture bedpan, and the other one uh, looks a little bit more like a regular toilet seat that we can kind of uh, log roll the patient kind of to the side, place the bedpan underneath them, uh, lay them on it, uh, allow them to, to use the bedpan, and then we can measure the amount of output um, from the bedpan. Um, we also, uh, um, on occasion, will have a situation where we're weighing briefs. Um, in the case of an adult, we might weigh the um, brief after it's um, been urinated in, um, and we will use a special calculation uh, to calculate how much uh, urine they're putting out by measuring the weight of the brief um, again over, over the course of a shift. Um, in pediatrics, uh, oftentimes you'll see that happen as well. Here uh, on this slide, you can also see the example of a baby diaper that we have on a scale and we're actually measuring it um, so that we can measure um, how much uh, urine uh, output it, there is. Um, we also usually measure how many uh, wet briefs uh, we've changed during a shift. Um, uh, here uh, we have an example of an indwelling Foley catheter. And so what you can see here is that we have um, our Foley catheter, which is a tube that gets inserted um, through um, the meatus uh, into the bladder. And then we inflate a small balloon, which actually anchors that tube in the bladder. And then urine can drain out of that tube directly into a drainage bag. And so you see an example of the Foley drainage bag in this slide as well. Um, we do that in order to uh, get strict output measurements 
Um, we don't like to leave, leave indwelling Foley catheters um, in our patients for very long because it puts them at a high risk for getting a urinary tract infection or bladder infection. And um, although there are patients that are in long-term care who have uh, permanent uh, Foley drainage bags, and those are usually leg bags. So here's an example of what a leg bag would look like. It's still the same type of Foley catheter that is inserted up into the bladder uh, with a balloon that anchors it into place. But here you can see that this um, patient has a leg bag that's um, just collected to their leg where urine can be drained. And it's the responsibility of the nurse to empty these uh, on a regular basis um, so that they don't, they don't get too full. And so um, what, when we do empty these, uh, we use this container and it's called a graduated cylinder, um, and we use it to measure fluids in the clinical setting. It's very helpful for measuring the urine that we drain out of a Foley catheter bag. Um, and so you can see a close-up here in the next slide that it contains 1,000 cc's or 1,000 mLs, and you can see that uh, it's measured um, on one side in ounces and on the other side in cc's or mLs. So let's kind of go back. So here's a graduated cylinder. Remember I said we may have a, a patient on dialysis or um, congestive, with congestive heart failure who's on a fluid restriction, and so the maximum amount of fluid that they may be able to have in a 24-hour period is only the amount that would, would fit into this graduated cylinder, 1,000 ml. So um, it's not a whole lot of fluid uh, in a 24-hour day. Um, and so they may require um, frequent mouth care. They might have very dry mucous membranes. Um, so we want to provide frequent mouth care, um, let them kind of swish around some water um, and spit it out even um, to keep their mouth feeling more comfortable. And so this is our graduated cylinder. This is um, a Foley catheter bag, and this is an example of how we would um, drain the urine out. So there's a little clamp um, that you can see here, um, and what we need to do uh, is pull the, the tube out and unclamp this clamp, uh, and when we do that, then we can drain the urine out of the bag into our graduated cylinder. You can see that there is a chucks that we put underneath the um, graduated cylinder in case some of the urine uh, ends up uh, leaking out onto the floor. And so we would drain all the urine out of the Foley bag, and then we would measure the urine before discarding it. Um, you can see in this slide here, um, we normally wipe the end of that off with an alcohol um, swab before we reattach it up into the Foley bag, um, just to keep any um, microbes from um, kind of migrating back up into the Foley bag. You don't want those microbes to, to migrate up into the patient's um, bladder and cause a urinary tract infection. Um, so aside from just measuring uh, the urine, uh, we also want to describe the urine. And so um, when we're describing urine, we look at the volume. So how many mLs of urine did we drain out? And we measure that. We also want to look at the color of the urine and document that. We want to know whether or not the urine is clear or cloudy. Um, does the urine uh, have any odor to it? Um, and is there any sediment in the urine? And so for color uh, description, here are some examples of how we might describe the color of urine. We might say that it is light yellow, that it is yellow, um, that it is amber. Um, sometimes urine can even be brown or it may have blood in it, in which case it might be red. And there are different reasons for that that we will talk about um, later. Uh, first, it's just important to be able to identify um, the color of the urine. Sometimes you'll notice that the nurse will say that the urine is straw colored um, as well. That's another description that we use. Light yellow, dark yellow, 
Um, the darker the urine is, the more concentrated it is. Um, oftentimes, uh, that's an indication that the patient is a little bit dehydrated and probably needs to drink more fluids. Um, we also look at cloudy versus clear. In this uh, picture, you can see two samples of urine. One of them is cloudy, meaning that when you hold the sample up, you cannot see through the sample. The sample is cloudy, and this can be an indication of, of a urinary tract infection. Um, and uh, the other sample you can see is clear, and that is what we expect the urine to look like. Um, if the urine is cloudy, um, it may be foul smelling, which is another indication that the uh, urine uh, is infected. Uh, and so we want to be able to monitor for this. Uh, and if our patient has cloudy, foul smelling urine, uh, we might wanna make sure we do a full set of vital signs on them. Um, the number one uh, reason for an elderly patient to become confused um, either at home or in a long-term care setting, and, and I mean acute onset of confusion, is due to a urinary tract infection. And so if you have an individual who all of a sudden has a change in their mental status and you notice uh, a change in their urinary output, uh, we want to be able to collect the data that we need to then call the physician and probably get some of their urine sent off uh, for urine culture and sensitivity uh, and, and urinalysis to see uh, if they have a urinary tract infection. And we'll talk more about, about what, what those tests are um, a little bit later. But cloudy versus clear is what you want to know um, for, for the purposes of this lecture. And then blood in the urine um, will often look uh, like you see it here. <clears throat> Uh, blood in the urine can be a sign of different things. Uh, it can be a sign of, of a urinary tract infection. It can also be a sign of kidney stones uh, can cause blood in the urine, and there are other things as well. Um, it's important to be able to identify blood uh, in your patient's urine and report it um, to the uh, nurse uh, manager, to your clinical instructor, um, to the physician, uh, so that we can then uh, investigate further and find out why this is happening. So, um, in closing, uh, I just uh, want to thank you for your attention today um, and remind you that measuring intake and output is an important assessment skill for nurses to learn. And you may have thought, yeah, it's just, you know, checking how much fluid they take and how much urine they put out, but clearly you can see that there is a lot more to the skill than uh, meets the eye. Uh, so thank you for your attention today and we will see you next time.